How's it going, y'all? Titan Smash MTG, and today we're going to look at week one of spoilers for Call Time. Look at all the stuff we'll be having standard here. We're going to go through color by color, card by card for almost every card in here, minus the ones that just are kind of unplayable for constructed. But I'm excited for this. We'll just go color by color, break it down, each card, what we think of it, if we'll see play or not. I'm excited for it. I'm going to kind of go as fast as I can with it just because nobody wants an hour long video of me running my mouth, I don't think. But hey, we're here, baby. It's new, spent, new standard, new spoiler time. Let's go! So the first card we're talking about here is Havlar, God of Battle, 4 mana 4 4. We already talked about this in another video, so I'm not going to breeze over it too much. Uh, creatures you control that are enchanted or equipped have double strike. Beginning of each combat, you may touch target aura or equipment attached to a creature you control. To target creature you control, the back half. It's two mana sword. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus zero, oh, and has vigilance. Equipped creature dies. Return it to its owner's hand. Uh, I think this card is decent. I want to see more of the set before I really judge it too hard. Um, as a whole, I don't think it's super, super impressive or anything. But just having the versatility, having the equipment when you need to have it there, but also the god side on the back end is nice. Uh, and especially in decks that really care about equipment matters and enchantment matters kind of thing, giving them all uh, double strike is really, really nice. So I think this card's kind of sweet. Another card that got spoiled today was Sigrid, God Favor. I really like this card. This is a 3-mana 2-2 two -two with Flash in First Strike and Protection from God Creatures, which is important. That means things like a cre like a creature like Thassa from Theros, if it's not a creature yet, can uh, that doesn't have protection from this, but if it ever turns into a creature due to its devotion, then it does have protection from it. So kind of weird there. But 3-mana 2-2 two two, two -two Flash in First Strike. When Sigrid, God Favored, enters the battlefield, exile up to one target attacking or blocking creature until Sigrid leaves the battlefield. Uh, I foresee things like this, and I'm, you're going to hear me mention this card a lot, but Skyclave Apparition, uh, say you go to blocks, you can have some really nasty kind of things where you flash this in, eat up a creature in combat, and then you get to take away your Skyclave Apparition that was chump blocking, bring it back to hand, so that way, whenever this Sigrid dies eventually, that Skyclave Apparition comes back and you get to knock something else off the battlefield. Really neat combat tricks with this card. I'm really excited to see how this one works. I think this is a great card. This one got spoiled this night. I don't think it's going to be in constructed playable, but decent for limited. It's a three mana deal, five to target that creature. But with Fortel, if there's, you know, Fortel payoffs, you can do this for one mana instant speed. And that's not too bad, but still, man, it's whatever. So moving on to the blue cards now, we have Alnred, God of the Cosmos. This is a five mana, one, one. What? Uh, it gets plus one, plus one for each card in your hand, and each for toll card you own in exile. At the beginning of your end step, choose a card type, and then reveal the top two cards of your library. Put all cards of the chosen type into your hand, and the rest in the bottom of your library in any order. So, if you have a full hand and you're winning the game, this thing can get really, really big, and you do get to some card advantage every end step there, which is kind of nice. However, uh, if you're kind of late in the game in top deck mode, this is a pretty weak card. So, overall, I'm not too high on the front side of it here. The back side is a 2-mana, two 2-3 two, flying uh, whenever Haka, Whispering Raven, deals combat damage to a player, return it to its owner's hand and scry two. Uh, I know my buddy Delmo's high on this one personally, not so much here. Obviously a 2-mana, two 2-3 two, flying creature is a really good rate, but if I had the option to keep it on the battlefield and then return it later, I would like that. But the fact that it has to return to its owner's hand when you do damage just doesn't seem like it's going to be worth playing. Uh, obviously an excellent blocker, but if you really want to be playing this as a 2-mana blocker, that's just not a super great game plan, I don't think, so... I know a lot of people think this is a really sweet card. For me, it's it ain't it. I don't think this is very good. Next one we'll look at here is another mythic. This is Alnren's Epiphany. Uh, I saw Cory Ballmaster playing this on Versus Live today, and it looked decent there. Uh, this is a 7-mana sorcery. Create two 1-1 one, one bird creature tokens with flying. Take an extra turn after this one. Exile it. Uh, first off, very glad they're exiling this because it's really painful whenever they get to loop the stuff back over and over and over again. However, this does have Fertel, so you can pay two... Exile it, it's kind of foretold away, and then you can pay six to do it instead. Now, it is a sorcery. If you do the, all the foretell stuff, that's eight mana total, but it does keep it away from hand disruption and things like that. Uh, I don't know. It's the, the way I see it, especially as a more aggressive base player, if somebody's paying seven mana to take an extra turn against me and make two one ones, like if that if that's what causes me to lose a game, then I've not killed them fast enough anyway. So cool card. I do think it will see some play if people at least try it out initially, but I don't think it's super good. Next card here, one that I'm really not sure how to evaluate personally, but this is Cosmos Charger. This is a 4-mana 3-3 three, three flash flying. Decent rate, nothing too crazy there. Fertelling cards in your hand costs one less than can be done on any player's ton, turn. Uh, you can fertell it for two, and then it only costs three to do the actual fertell. So, say on turn two, you can use the fertell to exile this. Turn three, you can have a 3-3 three, three flash flying creature, and it makes all your fertell stuff cost one less and be able to do it on the other, the other player's turn. Uh, the potential of this card is really, really high. I think a lot of this just depends on seeing the rest of the set and seeing what foretold cards kind of matter. 
Uh, initially, you know, we already have some cards that look decent with Fertol. We'll look at it a little bit later, especially in blue. Like, blue has some really good ones. Uh, getting to do a lot of this stuff at Flash and Instant Speed is really nice. Uh, as, you know, by itself, it's not an amazing card or anything here. But I think with the right synergies and payoffs, this card's pretty sweet. Just a glance over this one real, fit, real fast. Uh, Reflections of Lejarta for you. So five mana enchantment as it enters battlefield. Choose a creature type. Whenever you cast a spell, the chosen type, copy that spell. Uh, double Muxus, anyone? Uh, this is a really fun card. I think this is more for like EDH play. I don't want to see this making the waves on standard or anything. But it's definitely a fun card, and I expect to get janked out by this at least once. So this card I actually think is really nice. This is a glimpse of the cosmos. This is one of the blue, so two mana. Look at the top three cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand, and the rest in the bottom of your library in any order. As long as you control a giant, you may cast a, this from your graveyard by paying blue rather than its mana cost. Again, after you do that, you exile it. So you get to do this twice if you're a giant's deck. I've already been kind of tinkering around, like spoiler alert, I've been working around some decks here, and either a teamer or just got giants list on something I'm working on. And this is an easy four up there. Is getting to you know pay two mana, find you a nice little card there, and then afterwards you have one mana to do this again. Uh, that's a lot of value on one card there, and I think this will this will fit well. Now, granted, this does need to be in a giant shell. I think by itself, it's not good enough to see play. Uh, but in the right shell here, this seems super, super good. So this is one that a lot of people are talking about here. This is Raven Form. It's a three mana sorcery, exile target artifact, a creature, it's controller creature, one, one, blue bird token with flying. Uh, blue getting removal for like, like this is kind of insane because blue never gets this. Also, you can foretell it, so you pay the two again. I'm gonna quit mentioning that. We should know that by now. But his foretell cost is just a single blue mana, which is really nice. Uh, especially with the, you know, the, the mayor that we looked at earlier there. Pay one mana for tell this, one mana to do it again. So basically two mana to exile target artifact or creature is really good when you're talking about just blue. Uh, as a whole, I don't know if he's constructed play or not. I think people always get really high on these kind of effects because they get excited for blue to have mana. They have all the, you know, the, the turn to frog spells and all that kind of thing. I don't know if it's good enough ter personally, but the fact that it deals with artifact, especially in things like Demir that have a hard time dealing with artifacts, is relevant. So I can see the seeing sideboard play at the very least. Looking here, I think this is probably one of the best foretold cards seen so far. This is Behold the Multiverse. This is a four mana instant, scry two, then draw two cards. So basically, a uh, glimmer of genius. However, you can foretell this and then just pay two mana and do the same thing. So reasons I think this is good, there's there's cert certain situations here where you can pay the two to get this exile and out of the way. And then say you have four mana up, you can hold up Essence Scatter or Negate and then do this. Say if you have five mana, you can do this while still holding up an unconditional counter spell. There's a lot of room to play with this right here, and I think this is actually a super good card. So, Behold the Multiverse, one of the more impressive uh, effort toll cards we've seen yet. All right, moving on to the spicy stuff now. We're getting on to the black card. This is Valky, God of Lies. This is a two mana, two one, all to Balt, up to his shenanigans. Uh, when Valky enters the battlefield, each opponent reveals their hand. For each opponent, exile a creature card. They revealed this way until Valky leaves the battlefield. You can pay X and choose a creature card, exile the Valky with converted mana cost to X. Valky becomes a copy of that card. So in Historic, especially right now, I've talked about this on Twitter, and a lot of people either hated me or loved me for it. Uh, but you play this on two, you exile an opponent's Euro. The next turn, you pay the three mana, you become that Euro, you're swinging, getting all those triggers. And it's important to note that you become a copy of this, and you're not actually casting these cards. So Euro stays exiled. You don't have to worry about sacking the Euro because you're not casting that Euro. It's not entering the battlefield. You're becoming a copy of it. So, you know, turn two Valky, turn three Euro seems pretty disgusting. Uh, we'll see how it plays otherwise, but I think there's a lot of potential with this card. It's a super cool one. And on the back of it here, we have Tabalt, Comic Imposter. This is a 7-mana Planeswalker. Uh, it's Baltner's Battlefield. You get an emblem with you may cast cards. Exile with Tabalt, Cosmic Imposter, and you may cast spell, uh, mana is over any mana color. Uh, plus 2, exile the top top card of each player's library. Minus 3, exile target artifact or creature. Minus 8, exile all cards from all graveyards. Add 3 red mana. The back star is really underwhelming, I think. I don't think it's good at all. Uh, obviously, there's ways, like in other formats, you can cascade into this and do something really disgusting with it, which is cool. Uh, but for a 7-mana card, this is not effective enough at all, I don't think, and I'm not super impressed by it. So the front side, big thumbs up. Back side, unless it's late game, then you have to top deck it, big thumbs down. So Tegrid, Goddess of the Dead. This is a 5-mana, 4-5 with Menace. Whenever an opponent sacrifices a non-token permanent or discards a permanent card, you can put that card from your graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. That's kind of disgusting. Uh, I, I, I think this is a kind of cool card. Now, it is a 5-mana, 4-5 that does nothing upon entering, so it does have that problem. So as far as seeing actual standard play, I'm not really sure, but in the right deck, this has a lot of cool synergies. Now, the card that I do like a whole lot here is uh, Tegrid's Lantern. This is a 4-mana artifact. 
Uh, you can tap it. Target player loses three life unless they sacrifice a non-land permanent or discards a card. And you can play 3B, untap this card. So this is something you can do multiple times a turn if you want to. This is like Torment of Hellfire, but on an artifact. And I think I, I was I know a lot of people actually like that card. Never was super good, but it's a really fun card. So I don't know if this card's amazing or not, but I think with both sides being as viable as they are, this is definitely playable. So another card we got spoiled yesterday was Varagoth, Bloodlines, Blood Sky Sire. This is a two to be. So a three mana, two, three with death touch. You can do one in a black to boast. Target player searches their library for a card, then shuffles their library and puts that card on top of it. Uh, so getting a tutor for only one in a black is really nice. And the fact that this has death touch means even as a two, three, not a lot of people are going to be really willing to block it. Uh, now, granted, it kind of sucks you have to attack to get that trigger, but it'd just be too broken if you didn't. Uh, but still, getting a creature like this that can uh, kind of demonic tutor and search for anything you want, put it on top there, pretty nice. So I think this card has a chance of seeing some play here. We'll see how it works out in the meta. All right, moving on to red here. One of my favorite cards of all the cards pulled so far, and it should be no surprise to anybody who watches this channel regularly, but Goldspan Dragon. This is a 5-mana 4-4, four, four, flying in haste. Whenever Goldspan Dragon attacks or becomes target of a spell, create a treasure token. Treasures you control will have tap, sacrifice this artifact, add 2 mana of any color. The combo potential with this is crazy because you can just start pumping this up with spells and you make all the mana back to pump it again. So say if you have some stuff like the double the target power or give this double strike, you can just lay on the combo stuff here and just kill somebody right off the bat. However, you can also play more of a tempo kind of deck. Say you play this and go to attacks or they trigger it with, a, you know, they try to target the removal. That gives you that, that treasure token. You tap that for two mana, negate it. They try to do anything else again. You get two more mana to do something. There's a lot of potential here with this card, and I think it is super sweet. One of the cards we saw leaked earlier and it finally got officially spoiled today was Calamity Bearer. This is a four mana, three, four giant. If a giant you control, or if a giant source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it does double that damage to that permanent or player instead. I think this card is super disgusting. Again, I'm pretty high on giants right now. I think they have some potential in the meta. Uh, your Stomp's doing, well, I guess Stomp doesn't work necessarily, but if anybody targets your Bone Crusher Giant, four damage to them. Anytime you swing with any Giant, you're getting double damage here. I mean, you can just drop this and almost win a game from the spot if you have a good enough board. So I think this card is super co cool. Now, it is a three man, a four mana, three, four that doesn't really do much of anything without other Giants. Uh, but even by itself, this thing is swinging for six every time, so it's really good, I think. Last red card we'll look here, because we already talked about Magda in the other video, but Frostbite, single red instant. It deals two damage to target creature or planeswalker, but if you control three or more snow permanents, it deals three damage instead. So this is just like Flowery Impulse back in Sander, but we're talking about snow mana here. Now, the thing I want to see with all this snow stuff is so far there doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any like downsides to playing snow. So if we just get to a place where all of our basic lands are just snow lands, I think this is a really good card. Otherwise, we'll see what the, ma the meta kind of shapes up to, whether this is good enough or not. But usually these kind of things do have playable playable kind of slots and standard. All right, moving on to one of the most talked about cards today. This is Asika, God of the Tree. This is a 3-mana 1-4 with Vigilance. You can tap it to add 1 mana of any color. Other legendary creatures you control have Vigilance and tap to add 1 mana of any color. It's fine. I don't think it's amazing or anything, but it's, it's a playable card that has some neat little synergies there for ramping if you have enough legendary creatures. The backside here, we got Wooberg in the mana cost, so one of every color. At the beginning of your upkeep, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature or planeswalker card. Put that card on the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, obviously this kind of goes insane here. At the beginning of each upkeep, you're just getting the first thing that comes to mind and putting on the battlefield right away. However, I feel like with these decks that you're going to want to play with this with, there's probably not a lot of good stuff. Like, you know, there, there can be a lot of, like, say you grab a Sika. I mean, that's cool, but it's not a super big, powerful payoff. I think if you're going to play this card, like, you want to do it in a way where you have just stuff like Ugin. And that's, like, your big payoff there. I don't, I don't know. I know a lot of people are super hyped on this card, and I can definitely see it being good. Like, for sure, that's a cool effect. But this is also a 5-mana enchantment that can just get blown up in the turn. You pay 5-mana to do nothing, so... I'm going to say this is overhyped right now, but I could definitely see myself been proven wrong. Got a new Planeswalker friend today in Type Arkell. This is a 4-mana Planeswalker with the static ability of Elves you control have tapped to add black, which is interesting that it's black and not green. Uh, plus 1. Put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on up to 1 target Elf. Untap it. It gains Death Touch and end of turn. 0. Create a 1-1 one, one Elf Warrior token. With, I mean, that's it. You just create a 1-1 one, one for 0. Minus six, you get an emblem with whenever you cast an elf spell, it gains haste until end of turn, and you draw two cards. I don't think this card's good. 
even in a dedicated elf deck, I don't think this card is super good. I just don't think it does enough. I feel like this is going to be a big old trap card, and people are going to try to build elves just to play this. And even in a dedicated elf deck, I just don't think this is very good. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. I think this card stinks. Next up here, we have our Phyrexian friend, Vornaclex, Monstrous Raider. This is a 6-mana, six 6-6 six, six with Trample and Haste, which is already nice on its own there. If you put one or more counters on a permanent or player, put twice that many of those counters on permanent player instead. If an opponent would put one or more counters on permanent player, half that many, put half that many of each of those counters are permanent, rounded down. So this has a lot of a lot of applications here, and this is a super cool card. <laughs> so if we're talking about ourselves here, we get double the amount of counters we want. This this includes planeswalkers now, as far as I'm reading this right. So this is like a doubling season built into a thing. So say we play a planeswalker. It's coming in with double the amount of counters it has, so you can just start ultimating stuff right away here. And on the other side here, opponent's getting none of the counters, basically, if they just have one. So this means all the sagas they play, they're doing nothing. Like, they, get, they come in, they get zero counters, and nothing happens here. Uh, so Warner Clex just shuts the sagas down. Planeswalker they play in, half the amount of counters there. So you come up against the counters or token deck like that, half of them there. Uh, I think this card is super, super cool and has a lot of potential. And even by itself, say if you're just playing a creature deck, this is still a hasty trampler 6-6. Six, six. Card's good. Next up here in green, we have Col Colvari, God of Kinship. This is a 4-mana 2-2. Two, two. As long as you control 3 or more legendary creatures, Colvari gets four, plus 4, plus 2, and has Vigilance. So, 3 or more legendary creatures, and this is legendary already, so you just need 2 more. This becomes a 6-6 six, six for 4 with Vigilance. Uh, you can play 1 in the green and tap it. Look at the top 6 cards of your library. You may reveal a legendary creature card from among them. Put it to your hand, put the rest in the bottom of the library and end the order. Uh, it's fine, but again, you need a very dedicated deck to deal with this, and as a whole, I just don't see it being that good. However, I think it's still playable because the other card, the Ring Heart Crest. I love this card. Uh, we finally get a two-mana mana rock here in standard again, which is nice. This is one in a green. As it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type, add green, spend this mana only to cast a creature spell of the chosen type or a legendary creature spell. Uh, you know me, I love my Gruul. There's a lot of things in Gruul. You can do something like Warriors or whatever we end up putting. I have a lot in there there. But also, say you get something like a Questing Beast, you can still cast Questing Beast on turn 3 with this. So the fact that you have this right here is the Mana Rock, but also if you want to cast Colvari or something, you can do that too. Uh, makes it super playable. So the back side is what I'm more interested in, but the front side like has its places where it might be okay too. So overall, decent. Talking about elves again, we're talking about Elvish Warmaster. This is uh, 1G for a 2-2. Two -two. So 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, Elf Warrior. Whenever one or more elves enter the battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 one -one Green Elf Warrior creature token. This ability triggers only once each turn, which is really good, by the way, because if it happened all the time, that'd be terrible. Uh, 7 mana here, 5 GG. Elves you control get plus 2, plus 2, and gain Death Touch at the end of turn. I think this card is really good. Now, obviously, it's just a 2-2 two -two that gets stomped really easily, uh, so combat doesn't match up well against a lot of stuff. But this can start Elf Ball and Elf Control if you have a lot of Elves, and this is one of the better payoffs. I think this is much better than the Planeswalker that was revealed. So even though a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two isn't super exciting or anything, uh, just getting to go wide and cast all these Elves make other Elf tokens is really nice. So I think this card's cool. Next up is one of the cards I think this is one of the best cards that's been spoiled yet. This is Old Growth Troll. This is triple green for a 3-mana 4-4. Four four. Uh, it has Trample. Whenever it dies, if it was a creature, return it to the battlefield. It's an aura enchantment with enchant forest you control, and enchant forest has tap, add double green, and one and tap, sacrifice this land, create a 4 4 green troll warrior token with trample. So, first things first, you really need exile effects to get rid of this thing effectively, and if you don't, you're going to get eight up, and it's going to be really bad. Uh, obviously, a four mana, a three mana 4 4 trample is already a good rate here, but the fact that they just kill this with Heartless Act or something, and now you're ramping yourself, and then later on, late in the game, you can pay one and sack a land make you a 4-4 on end step, so it also gives you Wrath Protection. This card kind of just does it all. Now, obviously, Triple Green is a very tough mana cost, so this is probably just going in Mono Green type of decks, but we have Mono Green Stompy, we have Mono Green Food. We definitely have ways to make this card work. So, Old Growth Troll, it's a beater, and I think it's a good one. One of the early cards got spoiled very early on was Realmwalker. This is a 3-mana two, a two, 2 3 Changeling, uh, or Shapeshifter, sorry. But yeah, Changeling, so this card is every creature type, so this can also go in Giants. Uh, as Realmwalker in the battlefield, choose a creature type. You may look at the top card of your library anytime. You may cast creature spells of the chosen type from the top of your library. This card is really good. This card is going to be in any kind of tribal deck, I think, that fits in these colors. Uh, Realmwalker is a good card. We've seen effects like this where you can cast stuff off the top of your library. 
It's kind of like an additional source of card advantage. It's it's good. So this card has like a lot of different opinions on it, but I actually love this card. This is Toski, Bearer of Secrets. This is a four mana one one. The spell can't be countered. Indestructible. Toski, Bearer of Secrets attacks each combat if able. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So the way I look at this is kind of like, you know, a lot of times when you turn for it, like you're trying to play your Love Struck Beast and then go get, get Great Hinge. I'm, I'm looking at this kind of as a Great Hinge kind of thing that's a little bit harder to answer. Uh, an indestructible, uncountable spell is really nice. Uh, even against something like Control, like they don't really have a lot of things that can answer this right off cleanly. And they're not going to have a lot of creatures to block this. So this little 1-1 one -one can just kind of go to town and accrue you card advantage there. Uh, it does kind of suck that you can't hold it back as a blocker. But the fact that you just get this kind of send this in and eventually get card you know card advantage is nice. And in a deck that plays this, you're gonna be playing some bigger creatures anyway that are kind of hard to block. So I kind of look at this as like a great hinge replacement in a way. Obviously, great hinge is probably better, but I do think this like is worth consideration at least in the sideboard because against control, this seems fantastic. All right, finally moving on to multicolor cards now. Here again, one of the first cards got spoiled. This is Kaya the Inexonerable. This is a five mana planeswalker, three white black, five loyalty starting cost. This is a weird one. Plus one, put a ghost form counter on up to one target non-token creature. It gains when this creature dies or is put into exile, return it to its owner's hand, and create a 1-1 one -one white spirit token with flying. Uh, I've talked about Skyclave Apparition before, but something like this with Apparition, you put a, a token on there, you get to attack it and do what you want to do with it. If it ever dies or gets exiled, bring it back to hand and be able to cast again. Minus three, exile target on land permanent. That's about as worse off as you get right there. The minus seven, which notably comes just really fast, like it starts at five loyalty already, so th you know, you're on your third turn with this thing if it's not died. You get an emblem at the beginning of your upkeep, you may cast a legendary spell from your hand, from your graveyard, or among from cards you own in exile without paying its mana cost. That ultimate is a, just huge. The fact that even if they've exiled stuff, you can still get it back is really nice. Uh, for five mana, like this is, this kind of goes back to the Plains of Lockers of a couple years ago, where it just feels really fair, but not broken. Uh, I think this requires you to build a deck around it where you can really take advantage of that plus one because a minus three isn't good enough on its own. But with a plus one where you can take advantage of this, I think this card is actually super sweet. Another Planeswalker here we'll talk about, and it's a weird one. This is Nico Eris. This is double dub and a white and X. So three mana plus X, whatever you want to be. When Nico Eris enters the battlefield, create X shard tokens. Shards say they're enchantments with put, uh, pay two, sacrifice this effect, scry one. Sorry, sacrifice this enchantment, scrap one. Been talking a lot here, and then draw this card. So the plus one here, up to one target creature you control can be blocked this turn. Whenever that creature deals damage this turn, return it to its owner's hand. Minus one, Nico Eris deals two damage, a target tap creature for each card you've drawn this turn. And another minus one, create a shard token. Was watching Corey play this today, and it actually looked really, really nice. Uh, as a top deck late game, you can just sink a bunch of mana into it to make a bunch of shards. So that way you just have all this card draw for the next turn. Uh, the shards also play really well with this minus one because say you not you need you have something on the battlefield that you need to do four damage to this tapped you can sacrifice a shard draw that extra card and then do the minus one and deal four damage or something so a lot of versatility there uh, the fact that you can just use the minus one to make the shard tokens is nice but that plus one is super interesting I think and this definitely requires a different deck like this isn't going in your mopey dopey little blue white control decks with no creatures or win cons or anything it's not going to be good there but we talk about things like Yorion, we talk about things like Skyclave Apparition, talk about the the three mana thing that bounces anything there, or Gadwick. There's a lot of places I think this actually works really well with. It just requires a different kind of thing. But something like the, the blue-white blink deck that's kind of been a thing for the last few things in Standard here, just kind of off and on, I think this goes really well with, and I think it's a super cool card. So I'm curious to see how somebody actually makes this work really well. I'm not the person to do it probably, but I think there's somebody out there who's going to like break this thing. I think it's super cool. Another late card spool today was Coma Cosmos Serpent. This is a 7 mana, 3, green green, blue blue, uh, for a 6-6 six, six that can't be countered at the beginning of each upkeep. Each upkeep. Create a 3-3 three, three blue serpent creature token named Coma's Coil. Sacrifice another serpent. You can choose one. You can either tap target permanent. Its activated abilities can't be activated this turn. Or Coma Cosmos Serpent gains indestructible and end a turn. This is like the most cool but fair semi card I've seen in a while. Now obviously a 6-6 six, six for 7 mana that can't be countered, that's still fine. And making a 3-3 three, three on every upkeep, not just your own, but every upkeep is really cool. Um, it, it's still something that you know kind of just get killed right away once you play it. For 7 mana, that's not what you want a lot of times. 
But if this gets to just have a turn or two to get rolling, this is going to have a lot of value and be very hard to kill. So I think this is one of the better, just well-designed Simic cards I've done in a while. Don't know if it's good enough to see a bunch of play, but it is super cool and I'll probably end up trying it. All right, getting down to the end here, this is Awaken the Troll. This is a six mana Guru enchantment, or sorry, Saga. Uh, chapter one, destroy target land. Chapter two, put target land from a graveyard on the battlefield under your control. That seems kind of niche, but it's actually kind of cool. It's like you destroy their land, and then you get to put it right back on the number two. Number three, choose target opponent. If they control less lands than you, create a 4-4 four, four warrior troll token for with reach equal to the, the difference in lands. So you're going to be playing this in like a teamer or a gruel ramp kind of thing. And the fact that you destroy target land on one and then get another one on two means you're probably going to be ahead on lands them anyway. Especially, like, say we're playing mono red and they're kind of stalling lands a little bit. We're, we're just kind of controlling the battlefield. That chapter three goes off when we make three or four four fours. That's brutal. So as dopey as this card looks, I think this is actually super sweet. And obviously I'm biased because it's gruel, but I love this. This is her off. We've seen this one before. Neat card. Just don't think it's very good. That's really all I've got about this one. Another saga that was shown off yesterday is Binding of the Old Gods. I'm not sure what to think about this one. I'm like 50-50 on it, but this is a 4-mana enchantment. Uh, 2, black, green. Number 1, destroy target non-land permanent and opponent controls. That's good. Number 2, search your library for a forest card, put it on the battlefield tap, then shuffle your library. That's pretty good. Number 3, creature you control gain death touch at the end of turn. Don't see this being relevant at all in the kind of deck that want to play this. But this goes right into Yorion shells, whether it be Sultai Yorion or Abzan Yorion. I think this card is pretty sweet as a whole in those kind of decks. And even by itself, like getting destroyed about anything on Chapter 1, ramping a little bit on 2, that's good enough there. So, not sure if it's quite worth it or not, but as a whole, I think 4 mana for this is very reasonable. Another card that I'm pretty excited about here is Invasion of the Giants. This is, again, this is Giants get good payoffs, so and I think this card is super good. Uh... Blue and a red, so two mana. Number one, scry two. Meh, it's whatever. Uh, number two, draw a card, then you may reveal a giant card from your hand. When you do, Invasion of the Giants deals two damage to target opponent or Planeswalker. That hitting Planeswalkers is actually really nice. So you get to scry one, or sorry, scry two on the first chapter. You're bolting somebody and drawing a card on the second chapter. Then turn three, the next giant spell you cast costs two less to cast this turn. So we're talking one mana Bone Crusher Giant, two mana, four mana Giant. This is... This card is super, super good. This is probably one of the best sagas they've revealed in a while. And I think even without the giant stuff, like the first and second chapter, you can just throw this in as a, as a control and it'd be good enough. So Invasion of the Giants, super sweet card. Another one that makes me heavily want to go into a Jeskai or Team of Giants shell. Last saga we'll look at here today, this is the Trickster God's Heist. This is a, another four mana saga. Number one, you may exchange control of two target creatures. Number two, you may exchange control of two target non-basic, non-creature permanents that share a card type. So stuff like lands and things like that. Number three, target player loses three life and you gain three life. I don't think this is very good, but I know there's enough Demir fanatics out there that will try this. Uh, if you build your deck the right way, though, these effects are super, super strong, but it's very, very specific. So I think this is probably more of a sideboard card, and it's a very niche sideboard card at that. But man, this could just wreak havoc on somebody if it hits right. I don't think we talked about Pyro Heroes in my first video, but it's a two mana artifact. This is basically like a birthing pod ish kind of card. You pay two and tap it to sack a creature, search your library for a creature card that shares a creature type with a sacrifice creature, and has converted mana cost equal to or plus one of that creature's converted mana cost. Put that card on the battlefield, then shuffle your library. Activate this only time you can cast a sorcery. I don't know if it's quite good enough or not, but effects like this always seem to see some play and be good. Um, we'll have to see. Like, obviously, you have to do this all in sorcery speed. is kind of rough, but that's, they'd be broken if you could do it otherwise. Um, but I think this is going to see some play somewhere. It's just a matter of how you build your deck. Again, changelings in this format, so that makes everything kind of interesting. There's a lot of potential to build around this, for sure. All right, last card we'll look at here for the day. This is the World Tree, which is a non-legendary lamb, which is just a flavor fell like crazy, considering this card. And it's Battlefield tapped. You tap it to add green. As long as you control six or more lands, lands you control have tapped to add one mana of any color. You add double white, double blue, double black, double red, double green, and tap it. So ten mana, sacrifice it, search your library for any number of god cards, and put them on the battlefield and stuff your library. I'm excited to see what somebody does with this. I think for standard, there's just not enough gods to make this actually worth playing. This is super janky, uh, but this works really well with Golos. And this works very well with all the other gods and historics, so I do think there's potential with this card, just not in standard, but it's very spicy nonetheless. 
But when you have a card called The World Tree, that's got to be legendary. Come on. But overall, that's what we got for the spoilers here in the first week here. Again, this is just Thursday, Fridays, and all the initial spoilers, minus some ones I just didn't want to talk about. But I'm excited for the set so far. There's a lot of cool stuff with it. Um, I'm ready for more cards to get spoiled because I love this kind of season. Uh, I've got my Aether Hub up, already kind of brewing some decks early on for placeholders. So Y'all know I'll have those 10 decks of standard ready to go whenever the set drops. But that's what we got for all these spoilers. Let me know in the comments what y'all like, what you want to see, all the things you're excited for in this set. We got it, baby. Let's go!